eyes were already heavy, the dashboard clock flashing 2.37 a.m. as my car cruised along the near-empty Arizona highway. I had been driving from Tucson to Sedona for a long overdue solo retreat. The road was a dark ribbon, flanked by towering saguaros and jagged hills. The only light coming from my headlights and the occasional star that peeked through the cloudy sky. I was reaching for my thermos of coffee when it happened. The radio, which had been playing a soft country tune, suddenly erupted into static. Annoyed, I fumbled with the dials, trying to find another station, but to no avail. And that's when I saw her, a woman in white, on the side of the road. Startled, I stepped on the brake. In the split second that it took to slow down, my rational mind kicked in. What would a woman be doing out here in the middle of nowhere, especially at this hour? My foot almost hit the gas pedal to keep going, but something made me stop. She was young, maybe in her early 20s, her white dress glowing in the dark. Her dark hair covered her face, obscuring it from view. As I pulled over, my gut tightened. This was against my better judgment. But what if she was in trouble? I rolled down the passenger side window a couple of inches. Hey, do you need help? I called out. The woman looked up, her face now visible, and what I saw made my heart skip a beat. Her eyes were completely black, no whites or irises, just a void of darkness. Can you give me a ride? Her voice was a whisper, but it echoed in my car as if she were sitting right next to me. Every fiber of my being screamed to drive off, yet I was paralyzed, trapped in her gaze. Then from the depth of my subconscious, an old Native American proverb my grandmother used to tell me surfaced. Never lock eyes with evil, for it will consume you. Summoning every ounce of willpower, I looked away, my hand gripping the gear shift. As I prepared to accelerate, she let out a wail, a terrible, mournful sound that seemed to reverberate in the air long after it stopped. When I glanced back to where she stood, or where she should have been standing, she was gone, vanished. I floored the gas pedal, my car shooting forward as if jolted by my own adrenaline. The radio blinked back to life, resuming the country song where it had left off as if nothing had happened. I didn't stop until I reached Sedona, and even then I couldn't shake the unsettling feeling that had enveloped me. Later, as I recounted my experience to a local, he nodded gravely. Sounds like La Llorona, he said, referring to the weeping woman, a famous ghostly figure in Hispanic folklore. She's been seen on these roads before. You're lucky you drove away. Whether it was La Llorona or something else entirely, I can't say, but I do know that the experience forever altered my perception of what lies beyond the realm of human understanding. Now, whenever I find myself driving on lonely roads in the dead of night, I can't help but wonder what, or who, might be lurking just beyond the reach of my headlights. My work as a geologist often took me to remote corners of Arizona, places where the roads stretch out into the horizon and the desert stretches out even further. A landscape that could be hypnotic in its repetitive beauty. But that day in September, the land felt different somehow, its eerie emptiness weighing heavily on me. I was returning from a soil testing job, driving my well-worn pickup down a highway I'd traversed at least a dozen times before. Dusk was falling, casting long shadows on the ground, 
and turning the sky into a canvas of reds and purples. I was listening to a podcast about ancient civilizations, their folklore and myths, which usually fascinated me. But on that drive, the words became a monotonous drone, blending into the background as I struggled to keep my focus. Just when my eyes were becoming a little too heavy for comfort, I saw it, a solitary tree standing near the highway. This wouldn't be remarkable in any other circumstance, but this tree was ablaze. Flames leapt from its branches, yet it didn't seem to be burning down. It stood there, a spectacle of fire against the backdrop of the setting sun. I pulled over, grabbed my fire extinguisher, and ran toward it. But as I got closer, I realized something astonishing. There was no heat emanating from the flames. Cautiously, I extended a hand toward the fire and felt nothing but the cool desert air. The flames were cold, or at least not hot. My rational mind grappled with this impossibility. It was then that I heard the whisper, a hushed voice so soft it was almost drowned out by the crackling flames. Help me, it said. I looked around, thinking someone must be playing a trick on me, but there was no one. I was alone with this inexplicable burning tree. Who are you? I stammered, feeling ridiculous for talking to a tree, but unable to help myself. I am bound the voice whispered, more audibly this time. Release me. Without thinking, I pulled out the small hatchet I kept in my toolkit for sample collection. As the blade cut through the bark, the flames flickered, as if reacting to my touch. Finally, with one last swing, I severed a branch. The moment it fell, the flames vanished, leaving the tree as it was, just a tree. I felt a sudden rush of wind and a feeling of liberation washed over me. The tree looked normal, mundane even, but I couldn't shake the sensation that something extraordinary had just occurred. I took the severed branch with me, storing it carefully in the back of my pickup. That night, I did some research and found local Native American legends about spirits being trapped in trees, waiting for someone to release them. Could it be that I had encountered one such spirit? Rational explanations eluded me, but the branch, still untouched by burn marks, was a tangible, physical proof that I clung to. Since then, my views on the paranormal have shifted. I don't know what I released that day or what it meant, but I do know that the desert is a place of mysteries, some better left unsolved others begging to be explored. Whatever it was, that fiery visage is etched in my memory, a constant reminder that reality is far more complex and wondrous than we can ever fully comprehend. The highway stretched out in front of me, a ribbon of asphalt cutting through the Arizona desert. It was past midnight, and I was the only car in sight. The sky was so clear that the stars looked like pinpricks on a dark curtain, and I felt as though I was driving through space, alone in the universe. It was a peaceful sort of isolation. But then my car started to sputter, Glancing down at the dashboard, I saw the needle on the fuel gauge sink dangerously close to E. I cursed myself for not checking earlier. Just as I began to pull over, my headlights flickered and died. In an instant, I was plunged into darkness, save for the dim illumination provided by the moon and stars. Nervous but determined, I managed to pull my car off to the side of the road. I took out my phone to call for help, but no bars. I was in a dead zone. Great, 
I muttered, contemplating limited options. That's when I noticed it, a soft bluish glow in the distance, beyond the road, somewhere amidst the cacti and brush. My first thought was that it was another vehicle, but the light didn't resemble headlights. It was more ethereal, pulsating softly, like the light of a firefly, but much brighter. Curiosity overcoming caution, I grabbed a flashlight and stepped out of the car, locking the doors behind me. I began walking toward the light. As I got closer, I realized the glow was emanating from a cluster of rocks arranged in a circle. The rocks themselves seemed to be the source of the light. I reached out to touch one, half expecting to feel heat, but they were cool to the touch. As my fingers made contact, the rocks glowed brighter, and for a moment I felt a strange sensation, like an electric charge running through me. Images flashed in my mind, strange symbols, a night sky different from our own, and faces I couldn't recognize. Just as quickly, the visions were gone. Stunned, I stepped back. The rocks dimmed, returning to their original glow. Shaken, I returned to my car, my mind buzzing with questions. When I got back in, I turned the key in the ignition, half expecting it not to work. To my surprise, the car roared back to life, headlights and all. Confused but grateful, I drove away, constantly glancing in my rearview mirror, half expecting to see the glowing rocks follow me. They didn't. But as I looked back one final time, I swear I saw them flash brightly, as if saying goodbye, or perhaps until next time. I don't know what I stumbled upon that night. Some local legends speak of spirit stones, rocks imbued with mystical energies, but what I experienced seemed beyond the realm of any folklore. Those glowing rocks and the visions they triggered have left me both intrigued and humbled, serving as a constant reminder of the mysteries that lie just beyond the boundaries of human understanding, even in the empty stretches of an Arizona highway. Our family road trips were always filled with laughter, games, and of course music. My wife, Aisha, our two kids, Maya and Sami and I, were on a summer drive through the heart of Virginia, heading towards the Blue Ridge Mountains. The landscape was picturesque, with rolling hills and dense forests flanking the highway. As we drove, I decided to scan the local radio stations, hoping to find some classic rock or perhaps a catchy pop tune. But what we stumbled upon was something entirely unexpected. The radio tuned into a station, WVLR Memories 88.9, and a soft, melodic song began to play. The lyrics spoke of a summer romance at a county fair, of stolen glances atop a Ferris wheel, and whispered promises under a starlit sky. Aisha suddenly gasped. I remember this that summer when we went to the county fair in Roanoke. We had our first kiss on the Ferris wheel. She looked at me with teary eyes, lost in the memory. But there was a problem. Aisha and I had never been to a county fair in Roanoke. We'd met in college in New York and had never visited Virginia until now. Before I could voice my confusion, another song began. This one was upbeat, detailing a family picnic by a lakeside with children laughing and playing in the water. Maya and Sammy's eyes lit up. That's like the time we went to Lake Anna and had that huge water balloon fight, Sammy exclaimed. Again, this was a memory that didn't exist. We'd never been to Lake Anna. Song after song, the radio played tunes that evoked memories we hadn't lived. There was the winter ballad that reminded Aisha of a snowy dance we'd never attended. 
and the rock anthem that brought back memories of a concert where Maya had supposedly gotten her first guitar pick. The atmosphere in the car grew thick with a mix of nostalgia and confusion. It was as if the radio was tapping into an alternate timeline, playing songs from moments that had never occurred in our lives, but felt as real as any other memory. As the sun set, the signal began to fade, and the mysterious WVLR Memories 88.9 was replaced by static. We drove in silence, each of us lost in our thoughts, trying to make sense of the phantom memories. We reached our destination, a cozy cabin in the mountains, but the events of the drive dominated our conversations. We speculated about the nature of memories, parallel universes, and the power of music to evoke emotions. That night, as the kids slept and Aisha and I sat on the porch, looking up at the stars, she whispered, even if those memories aren't real, they felt beautiful. It's like we got a glimpse into another life, another version of us. I nodded, wrapping my arm around her. Maybe in some other universe, those memories are real. And that version of us is reminiscing about our memories, wondering about a life where they met in New York and took road trips through Virginia. We laughed at the thought, but the magic of the forgotten playlist stayed with us. It was a reminder of the infinite possibilities of life, the countless paths not taken, and the beautiful moments that exist, whether we've lived them or not. It was a foggy evening as I drove through the winding roads of the Appalachian Mountains. The mist was thick, reducing visibility to just a few feet ahead. As I rounded a bend, I spotted a figure on the side of the road, thumb outstretched. Given the weather and the remoteness of the location, I decided to stop. The hitchhiker was a young woman, dressed in a faded floral dress that looked like it belonged to another era. Her eyes were a deep shade of blue, and there was a certain sadness about her. Thank you, she whispered as she climbed in. I need to get to Silverpine. I was taken aback. Silverpine was a town that had been abandoned after a mining disaster in the 1940s. Are you sure? There's nothing left of Silverpine. She nodded. It's where I need to be. We drove in silence, the only sound being the hum of the engine and the occasional droplets of rain hitting the windshield. As we approached the old location of Silver Pine, the fog grew denser. The hitchhiker pointed to a dilapidated sign barely visible through the mist. Just up ahead, she said. I slowed the car, trying to navigate through the thick fog. When I turned to ask her for more specific directions, I found the passenger seat empty. The door was still closed, and there was no sign of her anywhere. Confused and a little frightened, I continued driving until I reached the remnants of Silver Pine. The town was a ghostly sight, with decaying buildings and overgrown vegetation. In the town square, there was a memorial with names of those who had perished in the mining disaster. Curiosity got the better of me, and I approached the memorial. As I scanned the names, one caught my attention. Lila May Thompson. Below the name was a picture of the young woman I had picked up, wearing the same faded floral dress. A chill ran down my spine. I quickly got back in my car and drove away, the image of Lila May's sad blue eyes etched in my mind. The fog began to lift, and as I looked in the rearview mirror, Silver Pine disappeared into the mist, along with the phantom hitchhiker who had once called it home. It had been an exhausting day of meetings in Phoenix, and I was more than eager to make the drive back to my home in Flagstaff. The thought of my own bed was the only thing keeping me going, 
as I sped down the empty highway. Arizona's night sky was something to marvel at, endless and filled with stars, a stark contrast to the city lights I'd left behind. I was about halfway through the journey when it happened. A flicker of light in the sky caught my attention. Not unusual, of course. Shooting stars are a common sight in these parts. But then another flicker followed, this time a bit longer, accompanied by two more bursts of light. My curiosity peaked, I pulled over to the side of the road to get a better look. I stepped out of the car, the cool desert air filling my lungs as I looked up. At first, there was nothing but the usual celestial panorama, but then I saw them. A series of lights, glowing orbs really, moving in a formation unlike any aircraft I had ever seen. They were perfectly synchronized, darting around in complex patterns that made my head spin. It lasted for maybe a minute, but it felt like an eternity. Then, as quickly as they had appeared, the lights shot upward and vanished, leaving me staring at an empty sky. I stood there, dumbfounded. I'm a rational person, or at least I'd like to think I am. But what I had just witnessed defied any rational explanation. I considered taking out my phone to record the phenomenon, but realized I'd been so awestruck that the thought hadn't even crossed my mind until it was too late. Climbing back into the car, I continued my drive home, my mind racing with questions. Had I just seen UFOs? A secret military operation or something else entirely? And why me? Why there, on that empty stretch of Arizona highway? The questions persisted long after I got home and crawled into bed. Sleep was elusive that night, and when it finally came, it was filled with dreams of lights in the sky, darting around in formations that seemed to spell out messages I couldn't quite decipher. In the days that followed, I scoured news reports and social media, looking for any mention of the mysterious lights, but found nothing. It was as if I had been the sole witness to this celestial ballet. That experience changed something in me. Whenever I look up at the night sky now, it's not just stars I see, but possibilities. Countless, endless possibilities that stretch as far as the universe itself. Whether those lights were extraterrestrial in nature or something else entirely, I may never know. But they serve as a constant reminder that the world is filled with mysteries, and sometimes, those mysteries choose to reveal themselves when you least expect it, under a sprawling canopy of an Arizona sky. The Pacific Northwest is known for its lush landscapes, dense forests, and misty coastlines. But on one of my solo road trips through Washington State, I encountered something far more mysterious than the usual scenic vistas. I was driving along a coastal route, the ocean waves crashing against the cliffs to my right. As the afternoon sun began its descent, I approached a long suspension bridge named Elysian Crossing. I hadn't seen it on any map but it seemed like a shortcut to the next town. As I began my ascent onto the bridge, a dense fog enveloped the area, reducing visibility to just a few meters. But halfway across, the fog cleared suddenly, revealing a breathtaking sight. A sprawling city on the horizon, its skyline unlike any I'd ever seen. Towering spires shimmered with golden light, and intricate buildings seemed to float above the water. Entranced, I continued driving, eager to explore this mysterious city. But as I reached the end of the bridge, a disorienting sensation washed over me. The city vanished, and I found myself back at the entrance of Elysian Crossing, the bridge stretching out before me once again. 
Confused, I pulled over at a nearby diner. The place was quaint, with a few locals sipping coffee at the counter. I asked the waitress about the bridge and the city I had seen. Her face turned pale. Oh, so you've seen the Mirage City, she whispered. She beckoned an older man, introduced as Mr. Lee, to join us. He began, Elysian Crossing has been here for as long as anyone can remember, and so have the tales of Mirage City. It's said to be a reflection of a city from another time, or perhaps another dimension. Those who see it are said to be chosen. Chosen for what? I asked. Mr. Lee shrugged. Some say it's a blessing, a glimpse into a utopian future. Others believe it's a warning, a reminder of the transients of our existence, but no one really knows. All that's certain is that you can't reach the city. Many have tried, only to find themselves back at the start of the bridge. I left the diner with more questions than answers. That night, I camped nearby, the silhouette of the Elysian crossing visible from my tent. I dreamt of the Mirage City, its streets filled with people from different eras, all coexisting harmoniously. The next morning, I attempted to cross the bridge again, but the city didn't appear. It seemed my glimpse of the Mirage City was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. I continued my journey through the Pacific Northwest, but the memory of the bridge and the city stayed with me. Whether it was a vision of a possible future or a mere trick of the light, the Elysian Crossing and its Mirage City served as a reminder of the mysteries that exist just beyond the veil of our understanding. It was supposed to be a simple road trip. My friends, Priya, Carlos, and I, had planned a weekend getaway to a cabin in the woods. The drive was straightforward, a four-hour journey through the heart of Oregon's dense forests. We set off early in the morning, our car packed with snacks, music playlists ready, and spirits high. As we drove, we chatted, sang along to our favorite songs, and admired the scenic beauty outside. About two hours into our journey, we approached a tunnel carved into the side of a mountain. The entrance was framed by old, moss-covered stones, and the inside was pitch black, the other end not visible. Carlos, who was driving, joked, feels like we're entering the twilight zone. We laughed, but as we entered the tunnel, an eerie silence enveloped the car. The radio lost signal, and our voices seemed muffled as if the very air inside the tunnel was absorbing sound. It felt like mere minutes before we emerged on the other side, blinking against the bright sunlight. We all let out a collective sigh of relief, the tunnel's oppressive atmosphere still fresh in our minds. But as we continued driving, something felt off. The landscape looked different, more overgrown, as if nature had reclaimed the area. The road signs indicated that we were only 10 minutes away from our cabin, which was impossible given we had at least two more hours to go. Confused, I checked my watch, expecting it to be around noon. But to my shock, it read 5.30 p.m. Priya checked her phone, and it showed the same time. We had somehow lost over five hours, but the journey through the tunnel had felt like mere minutes. Panic set in. We tried to retrace our steps, but everything was a blur. We remembered entering the tunnel, the silence, and then exiting into the changed landscape. When we reached the cabin, the owner, an elderly woman named Mrs. Adler, greeted us. Seeing our distressed faces, she invited us in for tea. As we recounted our experience, she listened intently, nodding occasionally. Once we finished, she sighed, Ah, the lost tunnel. I've heard tales, but you're the first I've met who's experienced it. She explained that the tunnel was ancient, older than any records could trace. Over the years, travelers had reported similar experiences, losing hours or even days after passing through. 
No one knew why or how it happened, but it was always on days when the sun was particularly bright, casting the tunnel into deep shadow. Mrs. Adler's words sent chills down our spines. We were grateful to be safe, but the lost hours weighed heavily on our minds. What had happened in the time we couldn't account for? The rest of the weekend was uneventful, but the mystery of the lost tunnel stayed with us. We decided to take a different route home, not wanting to risk another encounter. To this day, we still wonder about those lost hours. Were we in some sort of time warp? Did we experience things we couldn't remember? The answers remain elusive, but one thing is certain. The lost tunnel, with its ability to bend and steal time, is a reminder of the mysteries that still exist in our world, waiting to be discovered. The old, wrinkled map called to me from the dusty shelves of my grandfather's study. As a child, I had spent hours poring over its faded contours and landmarks, dreaming of the adventures it promised in foreign lands. But one road had always captivated my imagination, Route 00. It meandered whimsically across the map, not seeming to connect any two points in particular. My grandfather said he had never discovered where it led, though he had searched for years. When I inherited the map after his passing, the unfinished business of Route 00 beckoned. I set off on a journey to trace its path, hoping to uncover the secrets behind this mysterious road. Mile after mile I followed it, the dotted line leading me through forests and valleys, over hills and streams. Food and fuel dwindled as the days wore on, but I pressed forward, drawn irresistibly by the promise of what lay ahead. The road grew steadily narrower and less maintained. With each turn, the surroundings grew more ominous, the way ahead darker. Still I continued, shadows now seeming to creep from the woods to encircle me. Finally, the crumbling pavement dwindled to a single dirt track through the gnarled trees. My heart pounded as I glimpsed a small light shining in the distance. This was what I had been searching for all along. I stumbled into a clearing, where the moldering remains of an old carnival lay sprawled before me. This was a place that time had forgotten, that the world had left behind. As I walked slowly past the decaying tents and rides, memories of my childhood began flooding back of warm summer nights spent at the county fair with grandfather. A carousel sat silent, once bright horses faded and peeling. In the hall of mirrors, I saw reflections, not of myself, but of friends and family, long gone. Around each corner lay a glimpse into my past, sending me deeper down forgotten paths in my own mind. I wandered for what felt like hours through the abandoned carnival, each exhibit triggering another vivid memory. The fun house with its warped mirrors took me back to the time I got lost as a child and stumbled out in tears. The broken down roller coaster reminded me of laughing wildly while clinging to my grandfather's arm. With every step, the past became more real than the decay surrounding me. I found myself mentally revisiting moments I hadn't thought of in years. The first time I rode a bike, school dances, graduations. It was as if this place held within it the very essence of my memories. Finally, I arrived at the abandoned Ferris wheel, rising skeletal against the night sky. One last carriage waited, as if beckoning me aboard for a final ride. I stepped into the creaking car, and as the wheel lurched into motion, began a slow ascent into the darkness above. Looking down, the road that had led me there now seemed to stretch on without end, two paths diverging, one into memory and one into infinite unknown. As the carriage rocked higher, pulling me away, flickers of past regrets and unrealized dreams began to play before my eyes. I saw the paths not taken, the risks not ventured, but interspersed were memories of accomplishments, loved ones, moments of joy. 
a kaleidoscope of memory and emotion engulfed me, somehow more vivid and real than anything in my present life. I knew then the truth about Route 00. It leads wanderers not to any physical place, but deep into the recesses of their own hearts, minds and fears, revealing their secrets. Whether it was real or only a dream, I may never know. But I emerged from that forest changed, memories made vivid again, mysteries of my own heart illuminated. The journey itself was the destination. Route 00 is an invitation to reckon with where you've been, who you became along the way, and where those winding back roads of life might yet lead, if you dare to follow them. The night was moonless and bitterly cold as I steered my rattling old car down the deserted back road. It was a shortcut I'd taken for years, but tonight the wind howled through dead trees with unusual menace. According to local legend, on certain winter nights like this, a phantom highway would appear branching off from this road, leading drivers to their doom. Though I brushed off such tales, a shiver ran through me as I squinted into the dark. Sure enough, my headlights suddenly illuminated a cracked asphalt path I'd never noticed before. A weathered sign read, Ghost Highway, enter at your own peril. An icy chill rippled through me. This must be the haunted road described fearfully by the townsfolk. Those who entered were never heard from again. Clearly, some force or entity lured travelers to their ends down this sinister passage. I hesitated gripped by both unease and morbid curiosity. The phantom road awaited, daring me to uncover its secrets, or sealing my fate. Curiosity won out, and I turned onto the crumbling pavement. My tires rumbled as if passing through a barrier between worlds. Instantly, fog rolled in, obscuring the way ahead. I drove slowly, squinting through the white veil that enveloped the car. The stories of this coast highway echoed in my mind. In Japan, a similar mist-shrouded road allegedly led to the realm of the deed, never allowing any to return to the land of the living. In Ireland, a phantom path was said to carry victims away, to be sacrificed to ancient pagan gods. What horrors awaited down this forsaken route? Glowing shapes began to form in the fog ahead. I gasped as they took the shape of hulking men with distorted faces and hollow eyes. They lurched toward the car, emitting unearthly moans. I swerved around the phantoms, breath racing. More began to stagger out of the darkness, clawing with spectral hands. It was as if the tortured souls of past victims now guarded this road, craving fresh prey. Tires screeching, I barely avoided the ghost's grasp. But escape seemed impossible. No matter how far I drove, the road stretched on endlessly ahead. Panic rose in my chest. I was trapped on this endless haunted highway that delivered all into the arms of horrors. In the rearview mirror, I noticed a vehicle approaching fast behind me. It was a battered old hearse, driven by a tall, shadowy figure in a wide-brimmed hat. The mysterious undertaker pursuing lone travelers to ferry their souls. As it drew closer, I noticed a coffin rattling around in the back, freshly filled. Was it meant for me next? I pushed the gas pedal down hard, speeding away from the sinister hearse. It kept pace, inching ever closer. Up ahead, I could make out a crumbling bridge spanning a churning black river. Passing over it might be my only escape from this nightmare road. I blew past the moaning ghosts and raced towards the bridge, Behind me, the hearse's headlights flared, blinding me for a moment. I swerved back on course, engine roaring as I neared the bridge. Rotting planks whizzed under my tires, and I braced for the bumpy passage over the river. But instead, I emerged back into the blinding fog. Somehow the bridge had transported me back to the start of the ghost highway, 
trapped in an endless loop. The mysterious hearse was gone, but the groaning phantoms still surrounded the car, seeking their next victim. Panic surged through me. I was doomed to drive this haunted road eternally until finally the fog spirits claimed me. But I had to fight. Gripping the wheel with white knuckles, I turned the car around back toward the bridge. It was my only hope of escaping this nightmare realm. The ghost wails grew deafening as I raced back down the road. I would not share their fate. Up ahead, the bridge came into view once more. Flooring the gas pedal, I rocketed toward it faster than before. This time as I crossed the river, I did not slow down. I blasted over the bridge, screaming a defiant cry against the denizens of this haunted road. Blinding light enveloped me, along with the groans of a thousand lost souls. Suddenly, I was through. The fog vanished, and the smooth pavement of the main highway lay ahead, bathed in moonlight. Glancing back, there was no sign of the phantom bridge or spirits that prowled it. I had escaped the ghost highway's endless loop. Shaken, I drove on through the cold night, grateful to be back in the land of the living. But the haunted road calls still from the edge of town, beckoning the unwary into its eerie embrace. Those who listen and enter face an eternity trapped between worlds, never able to find their way back home. Flat tire, middle of nowhere, no cell reception, the trifecta of a road trip gone bad. I cursed under my breath as I surveyed the situation. My car sat lopsided on the gravel road, as desolate a spot as you could imagine. The sky was beginning to bruise with twilight, and the prospects of changing a tire in the dark were far from appealing. Just when I thought things couldn't get worse, Headlights appeared in my rearview mirror, a pickup truck, ancient but well-kept, slowing down as it approached. A sliver of hope. Maybe I wasn't so unlucky after all. The truck parked behind me and out stepped a man, older, weather-beaten but spry. His overalls were stained with years of oil and grit, the name Eugene embroidered above his heart. Looks like you could use some help, he said squinting at my flat tire. Would be much appreciated, I replied, relief washing over me. Eugene moved with a quiet efficiency, unpacking his toolkit and getting to work. His hands were strong, deft, each movement precise. In no time he had the flat tire off and the spare on. There you go, he said, wiping his hands on a rag. Good as new. I couldn't believe my luck. How much do I owe you? He waved a dismissive hand. Consider it a favor. Just pay it forward when you can. I thanked him profusely, still awed by the timely intervention. As he drove away, his truck's taillights faded into the encroaching darkness, as if swallowed whole. When I got back into town, I headed straight for the nearest garage to get a proper tire replacement. While there, I mentioned Eugene and how he'd helped me out. The mechanic paused, his face turning a shade paler. Did you say Eugene? Drives an old Ford pickup? Yeah, that's him. Know him. The mechanic looked at me as if I'd grown a second head. Eugene's been dead for years, passed away in that very truck, a collision up on Millersfield Road. A cold shiver trickled down my spine. That's impossible. He helped me just a couple hours ago changed my flat tire and everything. The mechanic stared, then walked over to a cluttered bulletin board on the wall. He shuffled through various papers and pulled out a faded newspaper clipping, handed it to me. The headline read, Local Mechanic Dies in Tragic Accident. And there he was, Eugene, unmistakable despite the grainy black and white photograph, that familiar smile, those wise eyes, I felt my knees weaken, my stomach turn. Looks like Eugene's still looking out for folks, the mechanic murmured, 
reclaiming the article and pinning it back on the board. I left the garage in a daze, new tire in place, but my understanding of reality irrevocably altered. I had been helped by a man who was no longer of this world, a long dead handyman, still aiding travelers in distress. As I drove away, the thought weighed on me, heavy but oddly comforting. Whatever force let Eugene linger, it was a benevolent one, a shred of goodness stitched into the fabric of an otherwise indifferent universe. And as I merged onto the highway, my eyes flicked to the rearview mirror, half expecting to see those headlights one more time. But all that met my gaze was the open road and the gathering night. I was driving the empty stretch of highway late at night, glancing at the peeling billboards littering the roadside. Most displayed dull ads for cheap motels and roadside diners, but one caught my eye, a blank white sign marked only with black lettering. Turn back now. A prickle ran down my neck. It seemed less a warning than a dark prophecy, but I shook off my unease and drove on through the creeping fog. Miles later, Another mysterious billboard emerged. Last exit, one mile. Again, a creep of dread. These signs almost seemed to know my presence here, long after midnight on this abandoned route. I chalked it up to fatigue and the mist playing tricks. But soon, more ominous messages began to take shape in the haze. We have been waiting. Your journey ends here. Each gave me a start, my imagination spiraling. Who was sending these silent warnings? Distracted, I nearly missed a faded placard peeking from the thicket. Turn back, dead end ahead. I slowed, gripping the wheel. This deserted back road was a shortcut I'd taken for years without incident, but the sign's persistent warnings filled me with foreboding. Still, only a few more miles to go. I pushed on warily. That's when it emerged ahead a towering billboard stark against the darkness. Last chance. My breath caught. Dread coursed through me, but the road ahead remained smooth and empty. With a shaking laugh, I dismissed my fears as fanciful. The messages were merely pranks, not grim portents. But then, around a sharp bend, my headlights fell upon one final board, rooted in the dirt shoulder. Its message turned my blood to ice. Sarah, we are waiting for you. The breath left my chest. My name on this remote road, impossible yet undeniably real. These were no pranks, but dire warnings from an unknown force. I floored the gas pedal, swerving around the last sign. Had to outrun this nightmare highway with its messages from beyond the void. Tires squealing. I raced on through the dark, eyes wild for a branching road to escape this valley of omens. But the way ahead remained stubbornly straight and desolate, my only choice forward or back. And then, behind me, a new light flared, harsh and blinding. An engine roared, drawing closer until it loomed large in my rear view. An unmarked white van, creeping up fast, headlights seeming to glow with malevolence. My terrified gaze jumped back to the road ahead. No exits, no turnoffs to shake my pursuer. The van edged nearer until it was just feet from my bumper, high beams flooding my car. Trapped on this road between darkness and darkness, this was the end the omens foretold. So I made my choice, floor the gas and leave the road entirely. My car jolted down the rocky shoulder, slamming into the ditch. The van blared past, unable to follow. Wheels spinning, I gritted my teeth and slammed the pedal down, fighting to climb out of the gully. With one last grunt of effort, my battered car lurched back onto the pavement. The white van was gone, its high beams fading into the distance. I rolled to a stop, hazard lights blinking, breath heaving. A close call 
but I'd escaped the road's omens and my pursuer along with it. Relief flooded through me as I steadied my shaking hands, but relief faded to chilling awe as I peered behind me. At the spot where I left the road, there stood no ditch or rocky drop-off, only more cracked pavement stretching unbroken into the past. No gully existed to have trapped me. There was no earthly reason I should be free. The full force of realization hit me. This was no ordinary road. Something beyond reason led me here, and now let me go, spared from the grim fate the signs foretold. Numb, I drove on until finally reaching safe asphalt and lamp-lit streets. But I knew now never again to take that darkness-veiled back road. For I had glimpsed the void and those who dwell beyond. By some grace, I slipped free this time. But next time, I may not escape the highway's messages from beyond. The waiting ones would have their due. The leaves had just started to turn colors, and I found myself driving on a stretch of road in West Milford, New Jersey, known as Clinton Road. My buddy, who was a folklore enthusiast, had filled me in on the tales of the area. A notorious 10-mile stretch, it had more legends associated with it than any other road in the US. Stories ranged from ghostly apparitions, strange creatures, to even eerie gatherings of unknown societies. It was near twilight, that perfect hue of orange and purple in the sky, when I started my drive. I remember feeling slightly uneasy as the dense woods on either side of the road appeared to close in on me. As I drove further, the tranquility of the fall season began to be overshadowed by an inexplicable weightiness in the air. In the descending darkness, my headlights caught a glimpse of something by the side of the road, a decrepit looking truck from what seemed like the 60s, parked haphazardly by the side of the road. Being the good Samaritan, I thought I'd stop and check if someone needed any help. I pulled over a few yards ahead and rolled down my window. There was stillness in the air, except for the faint whispering of the wind through the trees. I called out, Hey, anyone there? Need help? To my surprise, a coin suddenly dropped onto the asphalt beside my car. I picked it up and inspected it. It was old and worn out, dated back to 1965. I recalled one of the legends associated with the road, the ghost of a boy who had died under mysterious circumstances, and if you dropped a coin on a certain bridge, he'd throw it back. Was this the bridge? A shiver ran down my spine. Just then, the old truck's headlights blinked to life, its engine roared and it started moving, backward. The vehicle didn't turn around. Instead, it backed up at an alarming speed, headlights blinding me momentarily. Fumbling for the ignition, I managed to get my car started and I sped away. The old truck seemed to follow for a bit, but its presence faded the farther I got from that spot. Relief washed over me as I saw the sign indicating the end of Clinton Road. But the coin? It sat on my dashboard, a grim reminder that not all legends are mere tales. It took me weeks to muster up the courage to drive by that road again. By daylight, of course. Whenever someone asks me if I believe in ghosts or paranormal activities, I simply show them the coin, a testament to that eerie autumn night on Clinton Road. I never really gave much credence to stories about the unexplained or the supernatural. Ghosts, UFOs, cryptids. I lumped them all into the category of campfire tales and tabloid fodder. 
But one late night drive through the desolate stretches of Arizona's highways changed all that. I was traveling from Flagstaff, a drive I'd made countless times before. It was around 1 a.m., and the night was as clear as it gets, the sky peppered with stars. The highway was empty, save for the occasional truck or car that would soon pass, a fleeting encounter with another soul in this vast, dark expanse. My playlist was running low on songs, and my caffeine high was starting to wear off. I told myself another hour and I'd be in Flagstaff, out of this car, in bed. That's when I saw it. The shape, or rather shapes, far ahead on the road. As I got closer, the shapes started to take form. They looked like animals, but not any animals I'd seen before. They were large, too large to be coyotes, and their gait was awkward, kind of hunched and erratic. I slowed down as I approached them. They seemed to be crossing the highway, completely unbothered by my car. The first instinct was to grab my phone and snap a picture, but as I reached for it, one of the creatures turned its head to look at me. Its eyes glowed an eerie, unnatural shade of yellow. I froze, my hand hovering over the phone. The look in those eyes was unsettling, inexplicably so. It wasn't just animal curiosity. It was almost as if it recognized me, or recognized that I recognized it. And then, as swiftly as they had appeared, they were gone, disappearing into the scrub and cacti on the side of the road. I sat there, still slowed to a near halt, my hands trembling on the wheel. I drove off, my heart pounding and my mind racing. Rational explanations came and went. Desert barrages, maybe? Or perhaps they were just animals distorted by the dark and my own sleepy imagination. Yet that look, that haunting, penetrating gaze stayed with me. When I finally got to Flagstaff, I couldn't shake off the unease. I looked up local legends and folklore about Arizona's highways and found tales of skinwalkers shape-shifting creatures from Native American folklore. Could that be what I encountered? I didn't know, and I wasn't sure I wanted to find out. Since that night, I have avoided driving that stretch of highway, always opting for alternative routes even if they add time to my journey. I've also stopped scoffing at tales of the unexplained. After all, there are things out there in the dark. Lonely roads of Arizona, that defy understanding, and I've seen them with my own eyes.